All right, uh, ladies, gentlemen, and those of us who know better, um, welcome to open at RIT's talk on Mystic, an initial impact, an initial effort in academic uh, metrics, impact, and community. Um, my name is Emmy Simpson. I use any pronouns except for she, her, and I am the full stack developer at Open at RIT. And I will leave it with my co-presenter to introduce himself and a little bit more about us. Hi, I'm Steve Jacobs. Uh, I've been teaching open source at RIT for 12, 13 years, give or take, and within the last year was generously provided the opportunity by my university to open an academic OSPO. Um, we, uh, we took a hint from Saeed and Hopkins and decided to spin open our own. And one of the things that is a challenge, um, I suppose I have to, what are, am I up, down, or, or Space return? Spacebar. Spacebar, all right. Okay, so why an open programs office? Open work happens everywhere in a university. Open software, open hardware, open research, open science, open data, open OERs, open other things I've forgotten. Um, we tend to bubble those as open work, and that's why we're an open programs office at RIT versus an open source programs office because we wanted to signal to the entire academic community, artists, humanitarian folks, etc., that all are welcome and we want to support all that kind of stuff, not just software. Um, what kind of research? Uh, we have been privileged to be uh, supported by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to take a construct that we created uh, years ago called LibreCore, which connects my student workers in software engineering or open source community with NGOs and external organizations that need support to moving that, moving a team inward to focus for faculty research, support faculty research. Um, when we put out our first call for presentations, we got 26 proposals sent to us, um, about 23 of which we are able to serve because some of them were kind of out of scope of what we do. And they range from computational astrophysics to accessibility for open access journals to vineyard genomics to uh, my favorite name out of all the proposals, the Victorian Autobiographical Information Network or VANE, which like really just made me happy to be able to fund anything called VANE. Um, and we provide student teams to help these folks promote their research out to an open community. In general, we are not building stuff for them. We are helping them move stuff out in the open because they don't know how to. We're helping them reboot uh, an open source community by providing uh, better comms, better web access, those types of things. So unlike most support teams in open source where you find primarily engineers, uh, Emmy is my current engineer, go Emmy. Uh, but everybody else is UI, UX, project management, writer, um, designer, uh, industrial. We have an industrial designer working on our playbook. So we're, we're almost a digital services bureau to support open research. That's what we're doing. Um, what makes an ap academic OSPO different? We've got three different constituencies. Um, we have, in, in industry, you have your employees, and you work with your employees, their staff, their roles are well defined. And generally they're supposed to do what you tell them, ha ha ha. Uh, we have students, and students are in fact a different class. Now that feels like it should be obvious on its face, but it's not in that at most universities, they're essentially staff in that anything they do is owned by the university. Right, whether it's homework or anything else, the IP belongs to the university. At RIT, unless the students are doing work paid for off of a grant or as part of a work study program or any of those obvious things, they own their own IP. And so they're, they're a second kind of constituency that our open programs office has to address. And the third are faculty, which are kind of employees but because of the scientific method, their work is kind of sort of supposed to be open, unless they want to commercialize it or the university wants to commercialize it. It's gray 
And speaking as a faculty member, I can say that you can't tell us to do anything anyway. So whatever you try to set up may or may not take hold. So various different folks. And in an ideal world, however, most of these folks are aiming at research and scholarship and open, f open work first. How do we coordinate this? How do we even find out who's doing what on campus? Well, Hopkins, myself, other folks, we're, we're trying to figure that out. And one way that we're trying to figure that out is through the stuff you folks do, right? One way we're hoping to collect data on what faculty are doing in terms of things being open is to give them the tools they need to defend their open work, right? Faculty generally get evolved, uh, get evaluated, offered tenure, offered promotion, based on things like numbers of public published journal articles and how many people have included that research, written that research, whatsoever. It's a very slow process. It's a very long tail. Academia doesn't really want to move more toward doing something that's more Agile, though there are forces in the world like the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine that are trying to put more emphasis on presidents and provosts at universities to change that culture, make, make things more flexible. It's ironic in that universities and pretty much anything no longer can exist without the World Wide Web standard, and the World Wide Web standard was created initially to make scientific work more communicable, to be able to disseminate it more easily. So even though we're all using it, academia doesn't want to use open work metrics and open work analysis to validate the open work that their people are doing. Am I making sense? Excellent. So, come on. Oh, I did all that. So why Mystic? Essentially, um, when I started talking about this stuff about a year ago, uh, Georg and Matt were kind enough to invite me to join the Chaos Value Group to start talking about what would an academic need that isn't in what Grimoire already looks at, what the group already looks at. So we've been talking about that. And as kind of an incentivizer, we're hoping that as RIT builds this system that allows faculty to demonstrate the impact of their open work in non-traditional ways, they see value and we eventually figure out what RIT's footprint is in terms of open work on the larger community. And, and, what the, and, and who's doing good work, who needs help, what kind of help can we give them? All those motivations are why we're looking at Mystic. All right, so let's dive a little bit deeper into the question of why Mystic. Um, and I think to do that, an important thing to look at is what is the state of open source at our university, and no doubt at a whole bunch of universities, as it is right now. Um, well, the current state is that we have absolutely no metrics. We have no idea what the current state of open source at the university is. Like, you know, we've got open source going on, but we have no way of measuring how much or what it looks like. You know, there could be 10 groups working on open source at the university. There could be 20. There could be 100. There could be every person in the university is currently doing open work. But we don't know about it because problem number two, open source projects rarely communicate with each other. So even when open source projects are happening, they don't know about the other projects and they don't necessarily talk with the other projects. And so it's very possible that two open source projects are doing things in very adjacent fields and they just don't talk to each other when they could be collaborating and building and sharing number three, we don't have the ability to provide resources to these groups because it's very hard to provide resources to a group that you don't know exists. And it's very hard to know, provide resources to a group that doesn't know that you exist. That's not an easy task and it's not one that frankly we can, we can really do at all. So into Grimoire Lab, I'm assuming that everybody here didn't stumble into Chaos Con without knowing very much about Grimoire Lab. But just in case, because I want to talk about it, I'm going to pretend that you don't. Um, and in fact, I'm not just going to pretend that you don't, I'm going to pretend that you are perhaps a liberal arts professor who doesn't know what Grimoire Lab is. And you have just stumbled in to 
open at RIT, and we're gonna we're gonna help you get set up with Gourmet Lab to help you grow your community. So thankfully, it's a very simple project process. This right here is the B Theory interface, which allows you to have um, open uh, open ecosystems, and you just add open projects to that. Um, and you can add several data sources of a type. Uh, don't forget to add your uh, GitHub API key. Um, and after that, you'll get all of these very fancy graphs on Kibiter here. And um, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Uh, we just got to add you into uh, the more good configuration file right here. Okay. All right, all right. And now you'll be over here on that. And OK, I understand you're confused. Don't worry. We have a very good graph for this right here. Um, so yeah, it's, as someone who has been working in in this area for several months, um, I've, I've learned a little bit more about this graph, but I still only know sort of superficial stuff. And I am a CS student who has spent you know, months working with Grammar Lab components and talking with you folks and learning what all of, all of this does. But I still don't think I could explain to you this graph in its entirety. Um, and if you are a liberal arts professor who is not majoring in computer science or data science, but perhaps in some form of literature analysis, you know, the, the difference between raw and enriched data and what Sybil and Kidash and Kibiter and all of these components are might be a little bit hard to grip in, you know, one meeting with your academic OSPO. So let's go over a few of the things that might be a little bit, might, might make Ramar Lab a little bit difficult to use in its current state. So number one, it's difficult to understand. We just went over that. It's a very big graph. And huge kudos to everybody who helped develop the components on that graph, because it accomplishes a very important task. And all of those components working in synchronous or synchronicity is a very impressive feat, and it accomplishes some very fancy data science. But it's a little bit hard to get into um, as someone who is not familiar with the project. Uh, number two, there's not that much access controls. Um, Grammar Lab works great if there is one organization sort of at the helm steering the ship. Um, but the moment you open it up to a wider community, whether that be um, all of the Open at RIT fellows or all of the open at, or all of the students at RIT or all of the faculty at RIT, now one person's mistake might corrupt a config file that makes the service offline for everybody, or God forbid you have a malicious actor who deliberately wants to do something to mess with the system. Uh, there's not too many access controls on the existing Grammar Lab suite of projects. Um, and number three, you have some very disparate components. In that last slide, we had a, a screenshot of Kibiter, which is the fork of Kibana that is, has lots of very fancy graphs. There was also Bestiary. Um, but those are two completely different websites with very different styles, very different ways of interacting with them. Um, and you, know, you might register an account on Bestiary and not have an account on Kibiter. And they talk in a lot of ways, but in an other ways, they are very disparate. And so inter-Mystic. Mystic is our attempt to sort of fix some of these problems, to glue together some of these components, or at the very least, hide the seams. Um, we want to make it easy to use. We want to make it so that there are um, any liberal art professor can come in and understand it right off the bat, or at least very easily. Um, and we want to add access control so that we can open this up to an even wider community. Um, so rather than kind of describing Mystic to you, I'd like to be able to take a minute to show you it. So here's what you get when you first create a Mystic account. You get one very big button um, that allows you to add a project. And let's just pretend I slap that button, boom. This is what it looks like to add a project to Mystic. So you have about four text fields. Um, it all fits on one screen. Just a project name, description. You can add data sources with just a drop-down box and test field. Um, and you can also add multiple authors. So let's just fill in some information there. Just pretend that that was a perfectly seamless transition. Wow, Emmy, your transition was so seamless, I couldn't tell that you just switched from a static image to a, to a video. But all right, let's, let's fill in the description. Um, we can jump down and add data sources. Um, no need to memorize what data sources. It's all right there. And you can type in things just like that. We're going to add a URL for Mystic, as well as one more URL for a separate piece of software called Mystic Coordinator that I won't be talking about too much unless people want to talk about it in the Q&A. Um, but just like that, we've already set up a project. 
Um, I don't do it in this demo to keep things simple, but if we had more than one person working on this project, we could very easily just add another person in there, and they would also be able to manage the project, and they would be listed as a co-maintainer. So once we hit save, another seamless transition, and we have a nice little card for Mystic right there. Um, but Mystic does more than create pretty cards, so if we click on that card, we'll get a whole page automatically generated from just that information that we put in there. So we've already got maintainers, we have a brief description, and all of the links that we're using to collect data about these projects um, are also listed there, because those links don't happen to just be a place where you can find data, it also happens to be a place where you can find information about the project. Um, and so we include that on the page as well, um, as well as some graphs, and let's zoom in on that. Um, I've actually pulled a bit of a switcheroo there. These are not the mystic graphs, but graphs for an unrelated project because I wanted to show off the issue duration graph, and there aren't enough issues in mystic to be able to do that quite yet. Um, but these are just three of the graphs that are currently programmed in, which are dynamically shown based on what sort of links you've added into the project. So because we've added two GitLab links, we get three graphs for that right now. Uh, a contributor's graph, which measures not just the contributors who have uh, code commits in the repository, but any kind of contribution whatsoever. So that can be opening an issue, responding to an issue. Um, we also have um, many other types of data sources in there, like um, the Open Science Foundation, as well as things like Mattermost. So if you add a contribution to an Open Science Foundation project, or if you're talking a lot in the Mattermost, contribution, or in the Mattermost channel, you will also get uh, displayed on the contributors. We have a general activity graph. So for, you can see that for this repository, there's a tiny little tick back in 2017. Um, the repository was laid dormant for a while, but then back in 2019, there was a big, huge spike, and it's gone a little bit up and down since then, but it's more or less stable. We can see that um, as far as issues go, almost half of the issues are closed <laughs> in less than a day. The rest are closed in less than a week, but there are a few that remain open for a year or a little bit longer. So you could use that information in ways that I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, figuring out what kinds of issues stay in what kinds of spots, and optimizing it so that your community becomes more friendly and more welcoming. So I'm gonna zoom out again for a second. Um, and up in the top left corner, I'm just gonna click that Explore button, pretend I'm doing this with my cursor, but I'm not. Um, so this is another core page that's part of Mystic. Um, and so here is a display of all of the projects in Mystic, because that page is very nice, the one that I just showed you. But I already know what Mystic is. I typed that information in. I don't need to be told what the description of Mystic is or where its links are. Um, that's all information that is very nice, but also deserves to be shared and can be shared and should be shared to help you grow your community and to help other people learn about your community as well. So to that end, we've added the Explore page. Um, which is a list of all of the projects that are currently registered in Mystic. This is just sort of a small section of the projects that we've added um, as a way to test things. Um, but these are some of the projects that Open at RIT has worked with fellows on in the past, um, as well as that one down there that we just added now. Um, so you can see that you've got lots of information about them kind of at a glance, and you can get that card. And if you were to click on any of those cards, you would be brought right back to that page that we just showed, um, where you can learn a little bit more about the project, how to get involved, and where that project is. All right, so pop quiz, what is Mystic? I just told you, so hopefully you were paying attention and you remembered. But number one, Mystic is a tool. It's a tool to measure your community. It's a tool to use that information and grow your community. It's a tool that can be used by students, faculty, professors, anyone who's kind of in a position of community management, who wants to make their community bigger and stronger and healthier. Mystic is also a gauge, and it's a gauge for not just the people sort of running their own communities, but a gauge for authors as a whole or any kind of wider community. We can use this as a way of figuring out where RIT or whatever university or OFPO or company is using Mystic and figure out where that organization is in open source. Get a measure on what kind of projects are out there, what kind of projects are active, what kind of activity. Uh, because don't forget, all of this is still built on top of Grimoire Lab, which means that if you want, you can easily open up a Kibiter dashboard and render whatever sort of dashboards and graphs your data science loving heart may want to see. 
But I think most importantly, Mystic is a platform for a community. Open source, more so than anything, is about community. You know, you can lock Linux Torvalds in a room for 30 years, but you definitely won't get Linux, let alone any of the thriving software that makes Linux Linux. Open source is fundamentally about community, about the ways that we collaborate and share and work together to build all of this software and all of these wonderful ecosystems. And I think that Mystic holds a very important role in making that community happen. Because you can't have com community without knowing where the other projects are and knowing um, what sort of space you're existing in. You can't have community without talking to other projects. And I think Mystic holds a place to be the glue that brings a lot of projects together and a lot of people together to develop these projects. And to that end, I think it holds a very important place, not just in OSPOs, but also in open source as a whole. All right. So and then, and just, just to bring it back to the initial interest in doing this, is it's also to be able to show, as a, as a faculty member, every year to get evaluated I have to reprint and edit and add to my 30 page Vita that lists every burp I ever did during my academic career which they won't read but they make me put out there that doesn't allow for the kind of work that I might be doing we get evaluated often by people who are not members of our core discipline I'm a game professor in a college of computing. Most of the people who look at my work, evaluate my work, evaluate me for tenure, evaluate me for promotion, don't understand what I do. To the point where 10 years ago-ish, we wrote a 10-page document to accompany every candidate from my department that goes up to explain, no, you're not going to see journal articles from us for the most part. We do different things. This is what impact looks like in our field. This is what translation looks like in our field. This is how we know what people are doing in our field, right? Getting those graphs out, getting those cards that will explain what the project is and why these numbers are important goes a long way to helping fix those gaps. And with that, I throw it open to mostly questions for Emmy because they are smarter than I am. So. Please remember to restate the question for the folks on the live stream. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Matthew Miller from Fedora. We have a bunch of weird data sources because a lot of our stuff predates like GitHub and GitLab being things, um, like a message bus, um, our own GitForge. How hard is it to get that kind of data into this? All right. So, the question was, how hard is it to take weird data sources that aren't necessarily easy to process GitLab and GitHub repositories and put that into Mystic and stuff like that? Um, to answer that, uh, Mystic is built on top of Grammar Lab. So, if Grammar Lab can kind of understand your source, um, then that is something that Mystic can handle too. Um, the one exception being graphs. Graphs are sort of manually put in there. But if you can come up with an Elasticsearch query, to be able to process that data into a graph, then it can absolutely be processed by Mystic. Um, and in fact, if you have your data sources as a Git repo, that's something that can already be processed right out of the bat. Um, Mystic has support for any kind of Git repository. But in addition to that, if you have like a Bugzilla or something like that, as long as it's something that can ultimately be fed into Grimoire Lab, then that is something that can be fed into Mystic. Um, just to follow up on Emmy very quickly before we go to Sean. Um, one of the things we pull data in from right now is the Center for Open Science's uh, Open Science Platform, OSF. So that's capturing more data than GitHub and GitLab, different data. It's looking at preprints, it's looking at a bunch of other things. Being able to build this out so it doesn't just talk about software. Um, is something that's, that's key for us, and I think that's one of the reasons Georg and uh, Matt invited me to start coming to meetings to try to figure out how do we do stuff that isn't grabbing the repository stats. Okay. And 
Sean, you had a question? Yeah, it looks like the back end is talking to MySQL. So are you taking your Morlab data and putting it in MySQL to display? Um, so the Glomarla data is actually still in Elasticsearch. Um, we use a MySQL database for um, tracking users um, and tracking some of the structural projects. But the actual core data, like the stuff that comes out in graphs and all of the raw and enriched data gathered by Glomarla, is still in a Elasticsearch database. <coughs> I was wondering what efforts uh, you're working on to create distinctions between disciplines of projects. Like it seems at OpenRIT, they'll have many different disciplines academically and, and otherwise that are being represented through um, these open this open work. And I was wondering if you have metrics that are trying to um, display that in some way. So the, the question was, how do we sort of display and represent the differences in um, what kinds of um, data and what kind of fields are displayed. Um, to answer that, we definitely have a number of sources that are like, um, as Jay had mentioned, the Open Science Foundation is data that is collected. But we don't have a specific discrimination between this is a science project and this is a code project, um, other than this has a bunch of GitHub links and this has a bunch of OSF links. Because I don't know if that's a particularly clear distinction to make. There's a lot of like science, Open Science Foundation projects that are also a lot about code. Um, and you can have a code project that refers to a scientific document or anything else that you can think of. There's always going to be interlinks. So we do back in boop, 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 boop. Boop. this one, um, we have like a little indicator to kind of give you at a glance what kind of data sources are linked in this. So you can see that uh, Monolith here has a GitHub repo, um, whereas, I don't know, uh, Test Smells has a, a static link to a website as well as a generic Git repo. But we don't um, explicitly make a distinction between different fields. And, and this, is, this is so alpha. This is really just the first step out of the gate, just a proof of concept and, you know, so much input desired for people on how we can do better with this. Go ahead. On the portion of the project that is for gauging, how are you choosing which projects to compare? So the question was, for the portion of the project that is for gauging, how are we choosing which projects to compare? Um, that might actually be a little bit more of an SGA question. Um, but the, the main way that we're doing that right now is although it might be in the future, um, pre predominantly through dashboards like Kibiter, um, which allow you to do analysis of the Elasticsearch data. Um, and so you can do any kind of comparison that you would otherwise do using uh, Kibiter and Grimoire Lab, but I don't know if SGA has anything you would like to add. So that alpha part, <laughs> <laughs> right, right now we're working with, so as I said, we have this pool of what will eventually be 30 projects we support over two years. We're starting with those just to try to use them as a sample to figure out what we need to do and how we can build things out. We probably won't roll this out to the faculty at large for you know probably starting in calendar year 2022. Um, just so we're well we're working with people who are getting support from us um, they're more likely to be patient with us because we're helping them out. So once uh, we, we don't want to have to do an analysis like we do on the Linux kernel on the rage hate emails. We want to start small and then grow. Just have to follow up. Um, so that pretty much means, let's say you're looking at project A and you are the one that chooses to compare it to project B. The mystic doesn't choose that project to compare it to for you. Uh, yeah, so the question was, um, as a follow-up, um, given Project A and Project B, your Mystic is not the thing choosing to compare those two projects. It's something that is done manually. And, and yes, Mystic does not, at least at the moment, have any sort of facilities to automatically compare those things. Yeah, the, the whole space of, of academic analytics is very mushy, very mushy. Um, there was, there's been this debate off and on about alt metrics Right, you know, well, 
I get lots of people coming to my blog, right? Well, but are they peer reviewed people? Are they really using your stuff? Are, are you gaming it and having all your friends put stars on this? You know, there's this back and forth about how do you move away from what used to be the gold standard, hopefully, of journal articles, because we do even that badly, right? At this point, those who are professors or graduate students here, you know, we, you, you set up your Google Scholar account and it searches the web and it finds out how many people have mentioned your thing and that gives you, what is it, an H value, an H factor? I can't even, an H index, right? So, so already they're reducing your entire scholarly career to a two digit number. Uh, it's far from ideal and, and it's a big, we're hoping to put some, some concrete examples into that debate to try to get things expanded out. But it's gonna be a long process. And, and the only reason that it's probably gonna pick up the speed is as I said, the, the national academies are now making a big push to have people open. If you're not in academia or research, there used to be this old commercial for a brokerage firm, I won't say which one, where you'd be in a restaurant and people are talking and there's all this buzz or a cocktail party and then somebody says, well, my broker is blah, blah. And the room goes silent and everybody's looking at, you know. So that's kind of like what the National Academies are. The National Academies are saying it's time to get very serious about open science, open data, open research, open scholarship. There's a, a meeting to get a cohort of colleges and universities trying to push this October 11th. Um, so we're going to see a lot more effort into working in this space. I don't know if that helps, but there you go. All right, we are at time. Thank you very much.